I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, the police unanimously recommend an indictment against the Israeli Prime Minister. France issues a stern warning against Poland's revision of Holocaust history. And we'll reveal the latest discovery by Israeli archaeologists. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. There are now shocking new developments in the police probes of the alleged corruption committed by Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu. In a bombshell announcement, investigators have just proclaimed they are in, quote, unanimous agreement that Netanyahu should face criminal charges and are prepared to recommend the attorney general file indictments against the prime minister. ILTV's Aaron Porras joins us here in the studio with some more details. Hi, Aaron. Thanks, Natasha. So according to a document provided by uh, Police Commissioner Roni Alsheikh, the police are now recommending that the prime minister be charged with bribery, fraud, and breach of trust, and that's all to do with case 1000. Uh, and that's, you know, uh, so case 2000, however, has to do more with a, an alleged quid pro quo agreement right. between Netanyahu and Yediota Chonot, uh, but the police still are, are a bit on the fence on whether or not to charge with that. Now, what about the allegations Commissioner Alsheikh also made recently? He said Netanyahu um, actually hired private detectives mm -hmm. to find damaging evidence and hurt police credibility, right? Yes, so, so Netanyahu has responded to that the same way he's been responding to all of these allegations since they've been recommended uh, at the beginning, and that is... You know, he's calling them false and delusional, and mm -hmm. he's actually also responded uh, to Facebook with a full minute response, and why don't we uh, take a look at that right now. והוא מתייעץ עם פרקליט המדינה. פרקליט המדינה אמר רק לאחרונה בכנסת שכמחצית מהמלצות המשטרה מסתיימות בלא כלום. אז אל תהיו במתח. המלצות יהיו, שלטים בנוסח ביבי אשם עד שתוכח חפותו, גם הם יהיו, לחצים פסולים, גם הם יהיו, אבל אני בטוח שבסופו של יום הגורמים המשפטיים המוסמכים יגיעו למסקנה אחת, לאמת הפשוטה. No. All right, well, I guess there's nothing left to do but wait and see what happens, right? And yeah, to hear back from the these. responsible legal body. Exactly. All right, All thank right, you. All right, thank you for joining us. Just a few hours after Israel announced that Saudi Arabia had granted permission for direct India to Israel flights over Saudi airspace, the Saudis are hitting the brakes. They claim no such deal has been made at all. Now, this denial doesn't come as a total shock considering Israel and Saudi Arabia do not have any open diplomatic relations. But rumors of a secret Israeli-Saudi friendship have been brewing for years, including joint economic, military, and even intelligence operations. This latest deal to use Saudi airspace would be the first major public display of such a relationship. And as announced yesterday, the deal would allow direct flights between Tel Aviv and New Delhi, India. The flights would also cut off over two hours of travel time by redirecting flights over Saudi airspace. India's national airline would be first to offer the flights, and Israeli airline El Al is demanding to be next in line. Prime Minister Netanyahu oversaw the final talks for this deal during his diplomatic mission to India last month. Though the Saudi government may be publicly denying any such deal has been made, India's airline is planning to commence the direct flights starting around Passover this year. After roughly six months of stalled relations between Israel and Jordan, today Israel has a new ambassador to the Hashemite Kingdom, senior official Amir Weisbrod. Here with more on what the renewed relations signify is Dr. Kobe Michael, a senior research fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies. Thank you so much for joining us. So with this new appointment, can we assume that the issue of the death at the embassy over the summer has now been put to rest? In a sense, not completely. I mean, uh, I assume that... Um, the new ambassador and the new uh, and the staff in the Israeli embassy will face some difficulties in their um, ordinary and daily uh, operations there in Jordan, and uh, it will take more time. But eventually, the the strategic interests that uh, Jordan has uh, in common with Israel are larger and bigger than everything else. 
Now, what challenges does Weisbrod more specifically face right now coming into this new position? I think that the main challenge is the Jordanian constituency, uh, mm -hmm. the Jordanian public, which uh, which basically is uh, is very hostile towards Israel. Uh, it is um, it is led by uh, by the uh, the elites, the Jordanian elites, yeah. intellectual elites, which uh, are very hostile, and they uh, actually nurture the the hostility and the hatred towards Israel. And um, at least uh, with regard to the public uh, operations of the of the embassy there in or activities there in Jordan, I think that uh, they will face some severe difficulties. Now, how do you feel about the state of Israel Arab relations as a whole and, and how, you know, um, obviously him coming into this position is going to play into the peace process today? There is no peace process. There is a stalemate. Um, I think that um, talking about the Arab states, we have to concentrate on on the on the pragmatic Arab state, mm -hmm. uh, the camp which is led by Saudi Arabia and Egypt mainly, which Jordan is part of it. And I think that um, the the major players in in this camp understand pretty well that the Palestinian issue became to be a sort of a burden, and they have some major interests which are much more important than the Palestinian issue. They know that. Uh, Israel should be part and uh, even essential part of uh, or, or component uh, of, of this alliance, which is backed by the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, they prefer to, um, to build the relations with Israel and to be assisted by Israel and supported by Israel yeah. towards the, um, the threats that they perceive as the severe threats, Iran and the, the Jihadiyya Salafiyya. And right, they put well, aside the Palestinian issue. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. International backlash is mounting against Poland's controversial new Holocaust legislation, which was just signed into law by Poland's president. France's foreign minister has just attacked the law on the global stage, urging Poland to reverse its regrettable decision. Nous trouvons que cette loi est malvenue. Et nous nous sommes exprimés d'ailleurs sur ce sujet. Il faut pas réécrire l'histoire. Ce n'est jamais très bon, et il faut surtout s'arc-bouter à la mémoire de la Shoah, la diffuser partout, régulièrement, systématiquement. Et donc tout élément qui pourrait venir pervertir cette mémoire est négatif. France is the latest country to join Israel in condemning this controversial legislation. The law criminalizes people who use the words Polish death camp to describe Nazi concentration camps used to exterminate Jews in Poland, including the infamous Auschwitz death camp. Poland's government says the law is essential to deter slander against its own country by people who associate Poles with Nazis. But groups around the world agree that the law dangerously rewrites a very dark chapter in human history by apparently underplaying the role many Poles did play in helping Hitler carry out his gruesome final solution. We all know that, that Poland was, uh, uh, was not running their part, the, the, the country during the Holocaust. Of course, we know that the death camp have been built by the Nazis. But you cannot wash away part of the history. You cannot take away the responsibility of the Polish government. And we see more and more signs from the, nation, the rise of nationalism in Poland, from the rise of anti-Semitism in Poland, from the rise of the calls to ban ritual slaughter and freedom of religion, that we're getting into very, very dark time in Poland. Poland had initially promised to work together with Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu to revise the bill, but that has clearly not happened now that it's been adopted by both the Polish Senate and President into law. Protests against Israel's controversial plan to either jail or deport nearly 40,000 African asylum seekers are continuing to escalate with the first wave of deportations set to begin in April. Protests have spread from here in Israel all the way to the United States. But we've just learned that the United Nations may now be stepping in to help solve this crisis. And ILTV's Brett Allen Smith is here with the developments. Thanks, Natasha. Well, this could really be huge. So an official from the UN's High Commission on Refugees says that they have now entered talks with the Israeli government mm -hmm. to make a deal on this. And it would go something like this. Okay, so Israel would accept a percentage of these 40,000 asylum seekers, ideally granting them refugee status, as most other countries already do. And in exchange, the UN would absorb the rest and resettle them in countries that they deem to be safe, which is typically the United States, Canada, and Europe. Right, and the key point here is not Rwanda right. and Uganda, Uganda. Uh, which is where most believe Israel does plan to right. deport the asylum seekers. Now, now I have to ask, how likely is this? I mean, we can't ignore the polls that we're seeing here right. in Israel, which say that 
two out of every three Israelis do support the government's plan. That's something like 70 percent, right. um, even if it means deporting these people with force against their will. Sure. So let's talk about those numbers, because you're right. Israelis are statistically way less eager to accept asylum seekers, even if they are recognized as legal refugees into the country compared to a Western country like the U.S., let's say. But when these same polls ask why that is, the answer is kind of always that it's because of, you know, it's because of crime. Of crime, drugs, yeah. Exactly. Those accusations are kind of always the root of those arguments. But we have to be real here because the Israeli police have largely debunked those claims. And that tape mm -hmm. that leaked yesterday from the deputy foreign minister makes it very clear that the government does know that their plan has some holes. Two Knesset members actually ended in Rwanda earlier today, a yeah. few hours ago, to prove that this plan is wrong. Well, even on a nuts and bolts level, I mean, the prisons have said that they're not no prepared. I mean, they're nowhere prepared to accept right. a massive flood of thousands of new inmates um, in the span of obviously just right, a few right. months. And most asylum seekers say they'd rather take indefinite jail time over deportation because those stories of human trafficking from Rwanda and Uganda are actually making their way back here. People are hearing about totally. this. You're totally right. And there's something else to consider here. Israel is a country that is very, very sensitive to accusations of racism, of profiling, of abusing excessive force. So that image of what those deportations could look like, especially mm -hmm. if it comes to force, or if and when it comes to families and women yeah. and children, like the Interior Ministry has kind of said that it might, this government should be extremely, extremely aware of what a PR nightmare Absolutely. that could be for the country. Well, uh, you know, obviously we're just going to have to wait and see, but I know a lot of us are waiting to hear more about these details, right. and uh, I'm sure a lot of people are crossing their fingers right now. All right, thanks, Brett. Sure. All kinds of industries, even the Israeli government, have been toying with the idea of completely changing over from cash to digital currency. These cryptocurrencies make transactions and investments easier in the digital age. And now Israel's diamond exchange, one of the biggest in the world, is preparing to go all in on the idea. Experts hope it's just what they need to reboot how diamond deals are done. We call it the second revolution because the first revolution was the internet, uh, selling diamonds over the internet. People didn't believe in the past that you can actually check a diamond uh, online. And nowadays it's a normal practice. The second revolution is uh, the digital currency because it will make our business uh, much more transparent, quick, and it will enhance the industry. Diamonds will always be a girl's best friend, but lately the world of diamond trading has been in need of a little pick-me-up. Even investors here in Israel's diamond exchange have been hesitant to continue trading, given the work, polish, and time it takes to turn a rough diamond into a sparkly profit. Well, the exchange is hoping to fix that with a little help from the digital age. We are going to deliver two tokens into the world. One would be called CUT, CAT is a token to trade diamonds and jewelries on a global scale. The other one would be CARAT, and that, that token is going to allow the outer markets, the outer financial markets, to finally invest in the diamond world. All exchanges made with these digital coins would be personally overseen and approved by the exchange. But Israel's justice ministry has been hesitant to back cryptocurrencies in general because they leave a lot of gray area for criminals and even terrorists to do business. Cryptocurrencies are a bit of a fad right now. I'm not sure about their long-term sustainability. Now, diamonds have an inherent value, and that inherent value has been around for centuries. Whether or not you can take that and hype it into something modern and something interesting like a cryptocurrency is highly questionable. So are digital diamonds really forever? We'll just have to wait and see. All right. Ask any Israeli and they'll tell you that we have just two seasons here in Israel, hot and hotter. So what should we be doing with all of that sun? Well, the co-founder of solar expert Israel, Alon Tamari, is here with the answer. Thank you for joining us. So, so first off, quickly explain what a solar photovoltaic system is it's even hard to pronounce how does it work so solar photovoltaics is about generation of uh, clean energy through the solar radiation we're talking about availability in israel especially mm -hmm. all around the year of uh, a lot of solar energy so we actually what we do we harvest this energy and we generate clean and free energy interesting so and and how efficient are these these panels today okay efficiency actually goes up uh, through the years we are talking about now something close to 20 percent mm -hmm. which means that 20 percent of the energy falls on the ground we can harvest it into our own use very interesting now, now tell me about the service how did you come up with this idea okay i'm doing solar uh, for the last 15 years and together with my partner mr ophir langman 
we've come into understanding that there is something missing. But on the mm -hmm. one hand, we have there are plenty of rooftop owners in Israel who doesn't know exactly what they should do. On the other hand, we have companies, and we actually what we do, we match between them. It's a marketplace that's on, uh, that's we bring these guys, the home, home owners and the solo companies together to the, for the same place and the system actually match them all, almost automatically. Beautiful. So so right now, where is this marketplace operating? Well, we started in Israel. Okay. It's a newly developed uh, concept. It's a platform, which is it's actually it's a cloud-based platform. Oh. So it's on the web. It's uh, In Hebrew, it's called the Mumchea Solari. Uh, so it's there for both the users and the companies uh, for the owners. Interesting. And, and you're planning on expanding this, obviously, internationally yes. as well. What, what is next? Next is to go to other countries. It's a okay. platform, actually. So we, we would like to multiply this platform. Right. It shouldn't be such a problem to do that. Correct. Which countries are, are we talking about? The United States? I mean, obviously, with solar energy, you're... Well, these days, yeah. not the right time to talk about the United States in terms of solar energy yeah. with the current president. Uh, although it's a, it's a great market. Uh, talking about Europe, Asian countries, Africa is going into solar, mm -hmm. and it's going uh, actually all over. All right, well, thank you for joining thank us. All right, Israeli fashion is making all kinds of statements these days. Princess-to-be Meghan Markle has just been spotted sporting some Israeli-made threads. And she may not be royalty, but if you've ever wanted to dress like a member of the Israeli Knesset, now there's a chance. Culture and sports minister Miri Regev's famous or infamous, depending on your taste, Jerusalem dress, was last seen when she hit the red carpet at the Cannes Film Festival. Now it's just gone up for auction. The bold fashion choice, a statement for sure, elicited raves from some and pans from others. Some found the dress itself to be poor in political taste, considering it depicted a 360-degree panorama of Jerusalem, which remains a fierce point of contention between Israel and the Palestinians. Still, others, including Regev herself, say the dress symbolizes everything Israel. Regev has proudly just put the dress up for auction, pledging that proceeds from the sale and we'll go towards programs for the advancement, strengthening, and development of Jerusalem as the eternal capital of Israel and the Jewish people. It remains to be seen if this dress will be a top seller, but as soon as paparazzi snapped Meghan Markle sporting Israeli-born designer Tamal Daniel's trademark bodysuit, well, that item started flying off the shelves. The world is keeping a very close eye on literally everything the soon-to-be royal says, eats, and wears, so at this rate, Israeli designers may have their work cut out for them. All right, my friends, many feared the worst when an Israeli family went missing after going on a hike in the West Bank this week. Rescuers, volunteers, and even police helicopters joined the frantic search, but thankfully, the hikers have been found safe and sound. The Israeli father and his three children hadn't been seen or heard from since Tuesday morning. They'd gone out for a hike on the Dragot Trail, which cuts through the Judean Desert and is considered one of Israel's tougher hikes. Many were fearful that the family had possibly fallen prey to a terrorist abduction or worse, something that unfortunately is not unheard of in the West Bank. But it looks like the difficulty of the hike ended up being the real danger. Rescue teams warmed them up with blankets and offered basic medical treatment to help get them back on their feet. And we're happy to say they're now back home and doing totally fine. People of all ages endure hardships in life, but when kids go through them without the necessary coping skills, the results can be even worse. Well, one organization is now teaching young people the skills that they need, and more, or here with more, is Bob Chernick, a psychologist with the Drive organization. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank all right, you. so tell us a little bit about what the Drive organi organization does. Okay, Drive is its nonprofit organization established in 2010 for the purpose of um, increasing high school students, especially high school students, resilience in dealing with hardship and difficulty. And recently, they started putting together a program that trains math teachers so that uh, the math teachers then can uh, convey these skills to students, of, uh, uh, s skills of increasing their motivation, commitment, drive, uh, perseverance. So, so my question here is why math teachers specifically? Well, one of the goals is to have students remain in the, in the high-level five-point math program. Okay. And they do that by having them train both in math, but also running during the course of the year. The math teachers, together with their students, 
our training in running for the goal of running in a five, uh, 5K race at the end of the year. So you have students who are not necessarily sports-minded and teachers, math okay. teachers as well, who are participating uh, during the year, they're training both in uh, learning their math skills, but so, also so, and in they're running. somehow incorporating yeah math into, into and, the running itself. That's, that's really, right. How did you guys come up with this idea? Well, we the, the um, um, uh, research from the brain has shown that there's a strong connection between physical activity and cognitive activity. Absolutely. We stimulate the same part of the brain when we're engaged in physical activity that we do during uh, cognitive activity during learning. Which is and why we should all be doing more sports. Absolutely, that's my motivation, right? That's right. So, so what age groups are you working with, and which this, age this, groups are you working with, this, and what this are the program results is, been like? uh, specifically with high school students? And uh, we, last year, there were 45 teachers who participated, 700 students who ran in the 5K race. This mm -hmm. year, there are 100 uh, math teachers involved in the program, wow. and 2,000 students will be participating in the 5K race. Beautiful, beautiful. So what is next? Uh, well, we, we, uh, I'd imagine we'll uh, broaden it to other, uh, other academic areas. But we've seen that our graduates, our, the students who partic participated last year, there's a transfer effect. And first of all, the students who participated last year will be running in the races this year as well. And we see that it has an effect on their nutrition, on their sleep habits. So it, it's, it's a very effective way at increasing their level of academic motivation. All right. Well, you've already given me motivation right mm -hmm. now. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Ever wanted to just reach out and touch your favorite TV stars? I mean, in a totally normal and not creepy way. Well, one Israeli startup is actually about to help make that idea a reality, or should I say, a virtual reality. The concept is simple but revolutionary, an ongoing virtual reality experience that literally takes you behind the scenes of your favorite TV shows, including real-life reality TV. And yes, even new shows just like this one. The Israeli startup Inception is developing an incredible new technology that would work with any VR headsets and apps. Last year, they got a $15 million investment from European media groups to help bring this idea directly into some of the most buzzed about TV shows. Inception is a leader in the ever-growing world of VR. They actually did a collaboration with Time Out magazine, which let users do a virtual, a virtual stroll through all kinds of exotic destinations. And they even did another collab with Fashion TV, which let you hang out with supermodels as they touched their makeup up before a fashion show. Bringing this idea to narrative TV shows, though, would be an industry first. Just think how awesome it would be to chill with dragons while watching Game of Thrones. But if this whole idea sounds like something out of Black Mirror, just brace yourself because the future might be a lot sooner than we all think. Now, if you've ever been to Caesarea, you'll definitely want to put it at the top of your next trip to Israel, home to some of the country's most gorgeously preserved ancient ruins. Caesarea has just gotten even more legendary. Archaeologists have just discovered a rare ancient mosaic while constructing or reconstructing the ruins. This one dates all the way back to the second or third century. The colorful, heavily detailed mosaic is an exciting discovery. Experts believe it's roughly 1,800 years old, which is very interesting, considering the building it was buried beneath dates back only 1,500 years old. The figures in the mosaic are all toga-clad men, suggesting they belong to the Byzantine era's upper class of society. In fact, the find adds evidence to the idea that this particular area was once an agora, basically an ancient Roman mega mall. Archaeologists at the Israel Antiquities Authority Conservation Administration are working around the clock to make sure this incredible mosaic, which weighs in at 1,200 stones per square meter, remains intact. Israelis and tourists all over the world will be able to see this mosaic for themselves in the not-too-distant future as soon as all of the renovations are complete. All right, it's, now it's time for our Hebrew word of the day. Israeli archaeologists uncovered an enormous and intricate mosaic in the ruins of the Roman city Caesarea. So today's word is Sridim, meaning ruins or remains. Now, as you may have gathered, Sridim can be the ruins left over from an ancient building like the ones in Caesarea or a building that's been recently demolished. Sridim, of course, can also just be the last remains of something, like how Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr are the last Sridim of the Beatles. But whatever Sarid or single ruin you're referring to, it's always nice to look back and remember what once was. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. You can expect partly cloudy skies throughout the weekend as a winter heat wave continues. 
The low tonight should be about 58 or 14 degrees Celsius, but then temperatures are supposed to rise by Saturday to a high of 79 or 26 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.5 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.